Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much. My name is Mr. G. I'm a poet, I'm a DJ, and I'm going to be your host over the next three days. Um, welcome to the Commonwealth People's Forum. All of you that have come from all over the Commonwealth, from Fiji to Malawi, from Bangladesh to Barbados, from Guyana to Papua New Guinea, thank you for coming. Hopefully you'll see some old friends. Hopefully you'll make some new friends, but it's going to be a very interesting set of discussions over the next three days. And we welcome you here to the wonderful QE2 building. Apologies for Big Ben and the scaffolding, right? I didn't make a note about it, but you know, what can we do, right? Um, so looking ahead to the three days of discussions around inclusive governance, key themes of justice, inclusion and accountability, and the renewal of the Commonwealth. I have to give you some housekeeping info, so if the fire alarm goes off, please make your way to the nearest exits following the green signs. Don't stop to collect your personal possessions. Don't use the lifts. The assembly point is on the lawn outside the buildings. Teas, coffees, and lunches are found all around in the Cambridge room on the fifth floor and you'll find the Wi-Fi details on the screen behind me, password forums 2018. And you can follow us on Twitter and get involved in the conversation with hashtag CWPeople. As I said before, I'm a poet by trade. And when I was a child, all I knew was my cot. And then I grew up a little bit more and then I knew the few rooms in my house. And then I grew up a little bit more, and then I knew a few streets in my area. And then as I became a teenager, I started to explore my city. And then as I grew a bit older, I started to explore the world. And so this poem is based around that experience of growing and traveling. This poem is called Citizen. If my family is my nation, then how can I be a citizen? If my street is my nation, will its laws be written in a way we can understand, so we can shake our neighbor's hand, united so we can cease to fight our fellow man? If my nation is my borough, would its focus be thorough? And how would we view others who we don't see as brothers, or should I claim my city amidst the grimy and gritty? Concrete streets, could I seek to find that which uplifts me? Now what about my religion or my country? Isn't that where my love's supposed to lie? But what if a strange war gets fought in her name, which doesn't always seem right? So can competition be confined to a football field? Or do graveyards have to be filled with patriotic zeal? Now what about my color? Doesn't that link me to another who shares the same struggle, my sister, my brother? But who then belongs and who gets pushed aside with the others? Do we separate the grades and shades to allocate who suffers? You see, we all seem to want to belong and just focus on our differences that are strong in us, so we look for groups, one to identify me, so I can wave my flag high and let it fly free, so I can cheer my team on by that I feel defines me. Whether it's right or it's wrong, it dignifies me. But my group can't be too big, and it can't be too diverse, because I want to feel that I'm elite, not common and cursed, because my group is the best group and no man can test group. If you're north, then I'm south. If you're east, then I'm west group. It's difficult for us to imagine there's only one human race, but we like to cling on to our divisions and exhibit our hate. Maybe one day we'll listen to the wise men who say, we don't own Mother Earth. Mother Earth owns us, and everyone here is like a migrant on a temporary stay. Thank you. I'd like to welcome to the stage V.J. Krishnanarayan, Director General, and Min Garcia, Deputy Director General of the Commonwealth Foundation, the Commonwealth's Agency for Civil Society. Big round of applause. Thank you, Mr. G. Colleagues, friends, Min, please. On behalf of the Commonwealth Foundation, it's our great pleasure to welcome you to CPF 2018. We want to thank you for committing to attend and engage in this agenda for Commonwealth renewal. 
It's an agenda for inclusion, an agenda for justice, and an agenda for accountability. With partners, we've developed a programme that we believe is relevant to the circumstances that civil society is facing and that will be useful to civil society once this forum is over. It's your forum, it's your platform, and we trust that you'll make the best possible use of this space. Civic voices were first raised in the wings of the Heads of Government meeting in 1991. On 12 occasions since, I'm pleased and proud that the Commonwealth Foundation has been able to support this coming together. And we do it not just because the Foundation, as Mr G rightly says, is the Commonwealth's agency for civil society. We do it because we believe that this is what the Commonwealth is for. It's for exchange and engagement on the challenges that our people face. Min? Thanks, VJ. When the Foundation was relaunched in 2012 and given the mandate to support people's participation in governance across the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth People's Forum was realigned to support this mandate. In 2013, the CPF in Colombo, Sri Lanka, contributed to the architecture of the post-2015 development agenda and advocated primarily for gender equality and women's empowerment as a standalone goal. That today is goal five in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The Malta Declaration on Governance for Resilience was the result of the conversations in CPF 2015. As CPF anchors itself in the prevailing development discourse, it does so by offering counter-narratives, challenging dominant paradigms. In Malta, CPF 2015 offered the governance lens to the discourse of resilience, which until then was analyzed only within an economic and environment context. It was also in Malta where the Commonwealth Heads of Government recognized the consonance of the work of the foundation with SDG 16, the sh shorthand of which is peace, justice, and strong institutions. These are the building blocks for CPF 2018. We are here to interrogate the issues of exclusion in the Commonwealth. Sessions will tackle tackle on or take on injustice as experienced by people in all their diversity and tackle accountability in governance. We shall engage and press on in the next three days to have a better understanding of the imperatives of a renewed Commonwealth. So as we welcome all of you to London and open the doors of QE2, the foundation with its dedicated staff who are all here and its partners share its defiant hope that renewal in and on the Commonwealth or of the Commonwealth and beyond is indeed possible. In these perilous times, now more than ever, civic voice matters. And it is with this buoyant optimism that we welcome you all and open CPF 2018. Thank you. On behalf of our host, the United Kingdom, we're pleased to welcome Penny Mordaunt, the Secretary of State for International Development to this civil society gathering. Penny Mordaunt, thank you very much. Thank you very much and welcome. I'm very excited. It seems to be a long time coming, but Chogham is finally here and I wish you all a fantastic week. As you know, the Commonwealth is home to nearly two and a half billion people. And that is an incredible opportunity. Two and a half billion people whose skills and talents can be harnessed. Two and a half billion people with their own experiences and their own ideas that we can all learn from. Two and a half billion people that together can shape a better, fairer, more prosperous and more sustainable world that we all want to live in. 
and we're already doing that. We're already making progress by focusing on inclusive governance and strengthening civic voices. The Commonwealth Foundation is supporting women in East Africa, push for greater legal recognition of gender equality. It's helping people in the Caribbean push for greener energy policies to tackle climate change. And it's helping young people across Southern Africa influence government policies that will directly affect their employment opportunities. The Commonwealth Foundation is working to strengthen spaces for civil society, to ensure that you all have a seat at the table when those vital policy decisions are taken, affecting the poorest and most excluded. Because without civil society, we are not going to meet the sustainable development goals. We're not going to fulfill the pledge to leave no one behind. And it's only by working with civil society and ensuring that you have the freedom to operate that we can hope to achieve the global goals on poverty, on education, on disease, and on hunger. In Bangladesh, I'm very proud that my department is working with the Manishir Jurno Foundation to help poor, marginalized people demand better services and push for their rights. And it's working. Government officials are listening. Public services are responding. More than 160,000 people have gained social protections they wouldn't have done otherwise. This includes the people most at risk at being left behind. Disabled people, destitute women, and minority groups. In Southern Africa, we have worked with Gender Links and the Southern African Gender Protocol Alliance to monitor and track progress on gender equality across countries in the region. And where necessary, to hold governments to account if they are not doing enough. Because without gender equality, we can never achieve any of the global goals. And gender inequality was one of the root causes of the recent safeguarding crisis. Vulnerable women and girls were not heard. We cannot allow that to happen again. And we cannot allow the people there to protect abuse in the trust that we place in them. Gender equality will inform everything my department does going forward. For without women's rights, there are no human rights. It isn't just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. The McKinsey Global Institute estimates that gender equality in the job market would yield an extra 20 trillion pounds to global GDP by 2025. And when we include women, great things happen. When women negotiate peace treaties, they are a third more likely to work. When women serve in the public services or the armed forces, these organizations become so much more effective. These are the benefits of inclusion. Inclusive societies are better societies, not merely because they are more just, but because a nation that doesn't utilize the talents and abilities of all its people can never hope to develop fully. How can a nation that excludes women and girls, people with disabilities, or someone on the basis of their sexual or gender identity ever hope to achieve victory? The answer is that it can't. Any victory would be a hollow victory. Any success that doesn't include all of society is no success worth celebrating. To be a member, equal member of society, that is a fundamental human right. And when we don't see that basic human right upheld, it should feel like an burning injustice. It should feel like something we must do something about. Whoever we are, wherever we are, it is something that should, should unite us all across the Commonwealth. And sadly, that's an injustice that disabled people face all too often. Globally, an estimated one billion people, one in eight of us, have some form of disability. And yet every day, they face greater adversity just to go to school or get a job, 
just to survive. That's why, in 100 days from today, we will host the Global Disability Summit here in London in partnership with the Kenyan government and International Disability Alliance. The summit will need, bring much needed worldwide attention to the lives of people with disabilities. It will mobilize a new global and national commitment to put into action the ambitions set out in the global goals and in the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. By working together, we can achieve lasting change for disabled people. And I would like to extend an invitation to all of you to be part of the next global movement to leave no one behind and to stand up for the rights of everyone in our communities. I want to thank you all for the contribution you make to that agenda. Let's show the world what we, the people of the Commonwealth, can do when we unite behind those common goals. Have a brilliant week and thank you again for being here and all you're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Penny Mordaunt. As I said, we're all gathered here for the Commonwealth People's Forum, but in the, within the same building, we're also having a business forum, a women's forum, and a youth forum. Today's, I suppose, theme is leave no one behind, inclusive governance, the challenge for a contemporary Commonwealth. Tomorrow, we'll be discussing the politics of hope. On Wednesday, there'll be accountable governance. Tomorrow, there will be an all-forum breakfast, so that will give us a chance so that the people forum doesn't just hang out on themselves. We get a chance to meet with the business forums, the women's forum, and the youth forum. And there will be a big lunch and a reception um, later on today. And so the discussions that are going on in the people's forum and the women's forum and the youth forum, then hopefully, once we all get together for the big lunch and the reception, then we can just share our different ideas. Because this is about... I suppose redefining the Commonwealth and looking forward to the future. Um, what else can I do? Five minutes. Okay then. Right. I've been given. I've been given five minutes. So I think I'm going to book. All right. At five o'clock, there's this book that's been written. It's called So Many Islands. It's stories from the Caribbean, the Mediterranean, Indian, and Pacific Oceans, and there'll be a chance to meet with some of the authors. Some of the authors are actually in the audience right now. And it's tales from Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados, Bermuda, Cyprus, Grenada, Jamaica, Kiribati, Malta, Mauritius, Niue, well, I hope I pronounced that right, Samoa, Singapore, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines, Tonga, Trinidad, and Tobago. I went to read into this book. It's really, um, it's very, very interesting for those of you who are from islands, because I guess there is an, uh, there is an island there's a certain culture that comes with being an island, being surrounded by the seas. And so many of the, the words and the passions and the experiences portrayed within this book do come forth. And so I would very much recommend checking out the Commonwealth Writers. Okay, right. And so as a result, of the discussions that you will be involved in over the next three days. On Friday, you will be part of, or some of you will be part of, taking a call to action to the heads of government. Now, the most sensible way to organize this is that each discussion has been assigned a rapporteur whose job is to make a record of what's being deliberated. At the end of each day, they will assemble with the content design committee and compile thoughts, ideas, and highlights that have emerged from each dis discussion. So can the content design committee stand up, please? Okay. Right. This is the content design committee. Thank you very much. These are the guys who are responsible for shaping the forum's program, and they will be keeping the whole process on track. So they will be meeting with the chief rapporteur at the end of Monday, at the end of Tuesday, then at the end of Wednesday. The call to action will be drafted and shared with you in the closing session. Then on Friday, the final version will be presented to the heads of government. And so that's in the sense that like every discussion that is occurring, 
notes will be made in order to get the, the gist of what's being discussed, and then it's all going to be compiled. And as I said, on the, at the end of Wednesday, the draft of what's going to be presented on Friday will be shared with you. Keep rolling. Okay, then. Right. Here we go. I'm going to go. Three. Okay. I'm, I'm going to do a poem. I've got a, I've got a brilliant poem. I'm a brilliant poet. I'm more comfortable as a poet than an MC. You know? Um, okay. I do, a lot of, um, I do a lot of workshops of creative writing, so that's my forte. And um, I do a lot of like, like teaching children to, I suppose, explore their creativity and explore just the thoughts and sentiments that were inside themselves. And so many times when you're trying to, I suppose, get a child to view the world outside of their own immediate wants and desires, that's quite difficult, right? Because I guess human beings are selfish by nature. And so sometimes I might say to a child, you know, why don't you write about your favorite animal? You know, like, what's your favorite animal? And so some child might just go, I like a lion. <sighs> Another child might just go, oh, I like a horse. <laughs> There's always be one child that goes, I like a slug. All right, brother, make a note about you, you know? But one time, one of the children I was teaching, right, just goes, oh, Mr. G, you know, what's, what's your favorite animal? Right? What's your favorite animal? And, like, I had to pause and think, right? I had to, like, go, wow, you know, like, if I'm really honest, like, my favorite animal is like a little red-breasted robin, right? And for those of you that ain't, like, you know, from, well, from me, I guess that's most of you, right? It's our, it's our national bird, right? And there's these tiny little birds with, like, a big red chest, you know? But they strut around so proud, you know? You can't miss them, right? Like, once you've seen it once, you will never forget it, right? And so I look at this robin, and I think to myself, wow, I can understand why a lion is proud, and I can understand why a horse is proud, well, I can't understand why a little tiny bird would be so proud. So one day I wrote this poem, which was based around a conversation which I imagined between two little red-breasted robins. And this poem is called To the Birds. Two red-breast robins awoke early one morning, father and son sharing a moment of calling. In the magical hours between dewdrops and dawn when all is calm with the world, Said son to father, dad, why do we sing and puff up our chest and limber up our wings when it seems to me to be a bird is but a lowly thing when man is in charge of this world? He builds a nest so high that it can disrupt the sky. He wears feathers in all shapes and all colors and sizes. His wings are invisible, but yet he can fly so high. So why should we sing in this world? Said father to son, yeah, man indeed is strong. He has the pride of a peacock and the grace of a swan. He even goes a little cuckoo when the weather goes wrong. For he believes that he's in charge of this world. He puts a feather in his cap as he tries to rule the roost. But whenever he gets scared, he feels the bump of a goose. Because we used to be dinosaurs. And that's the truth. And my son, that's why we'll always sing in this world. Thank you very much. She's here. Okay, then, right. That's got to be the biggest warm up we have ever, ever had for anyone. She's here. Right, okay. We are pleased to welcome Baroness Patricia Scotland, Head of the Commonwealth Secretariat, the organization that anchors the Commonwealth Summit. Can you please, please, please give a wonderful, warm celebration for the arrival of Baroness Scotland? Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, Excellencies, Secretary of State, uh, distinguished delegates, Commonwealth friends and colleagues. One of the great things about being Secretary General is you get to go to all four forums. One of the challenges is you get to run. Um, but if we look at um, what we have come here to do together and look at our charter, it's really quite extraordinary because the first words of our charter says, we, the people of the Commonwealth. Yes, that's what it says, we, the people. It's our opening words, not we, the leaders of the Commonwealth, we, the people. 
of the Commonwealth. So the People's Forum is of pivotal importance. And this is why um, you are the powerhouse of Commonwealth connection and the motor driving transformational change. Inclusive progress means that we renew our focus on those five Ps of the 2030 Agenda for sustainable development. That's partnership, peace, people, planet, and prosperity. Indeed, the Commonwealth Charter sums it up by affirming that our core Commonwealth principles are consensus and common action, mutual respect, inclusiveness, transparency, accountability, legitimacy, and responsiveness. Later, it recognizes that sustainable development helps to eradicate poverty by pursuing inclusive growth while preserving and conserving natural ecosystems and promoting social equity. It stresses the importance of sustainable economic and social transformation to eliminate poverty and to meet the basic needs of the vast majority of the people of the world. Also, that economic and social progress enhance the sustainability of democracy. And those are the words of our Commonwealth Charter. And it seems to me to sum up the agenda for this People's Forum. And it's, I think, important to remember that our charter was agreed in 2013, and the rest of the world agreed the 17 SDGs reflected in that charter two years later in September 2015. So renewal requires innovation as well as inclusiveness. And the new strategic plan for the Commonwealth Secretariat recognizes that the countries of the Commonwealth face financial challenges, and so does the Secretariat. The strategic plan says we have to chase ideas and innovation, leverage the Commonwealth network, and that's all of you, and go for global partnership, and that also involves all of you. And indeed, this Commonwealth People's Forum is the single largest opportunity for a diverse gathering of civil society to engage with Commonwealth leaders on global development issues. Commonwealth civil society extends far beyond formally accredited Commonwealth organizations. It embraces the thousands of groups, associations, organizations, and networks that connect people in and among our member countries. And the intergovernmental institutions and processes of the Commonwealth accorded access and involvement to civil society long before this became more generally accepted. And indeed, still today, collaboration between governmental structures and the voluntary sector is far stronger and more integrated within the Commonwealth than is the case within many other international organizations. And such inclusiveness is vital if none are to be left behind and goes hand in hand with the renewal that is so prominent in our minds this week as we work to extend and revitalize Commonwealth connection and impact. I have on earlier occasions referred to the process by which our Commonwealth Latimer House principles on separation of powers came into being. It's an encouraging example of how the Commonwealth really works 
and of the powerful influence within our councils of civil society. The original proposal emanated from a small, informal, ginger group of experts involved with Commonwealth organisations. Their ideas were taken up and developed more widely, including within the Commonwealth Secretariat. And ministerial buy-in led to the adoption of the principles by the Commonwealth heads of government. But it started with civil society. And this progression shows how, working together, we can build swiftly and productively on Commonwealth connection at multiple levels, often starting with the voluntary sector. And there are other examples of similar processes leading to pioneering Commonwealth impact. They also demonstrate what one observer characterized as the special ability of Commonwealth to bring soul to international affairs. And the commitment and soul each and every one of you bring to this forum and to the many other expressions of Commonwealth connection in which you are engaged add immeasurably to our collective impact and influence. And we really need you. We need one another. We each add to all that is given and gained through interaction by, with, and for the people of our member countries. And that is the message of inclusive governance, the challenge for a contemporary Commonwealth. I am absolutely sure that this forum, you will come up with some inspiring, challenging, important initiatives, which may just be the spark that will enable us to do something quite extraordinary and meet with greater degree of passion and effectiveness those five Ps and make them into a reality so that no one in our 2.4 billion people is truly left behind. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, Baroness Patricia Scotland. Because you do not heed the voices of imagination, neither the tongues of trees nor the utterances of poets, Earth will erupt in a conspiracy of poetry and nature. Earthquake and the landslide will snap and grind to rubble your bale high idols of concrete and metal. Fire will shrivel the prefabricated palaces, swelling like boils on our inflamed land. Wind will shatter the thin cocktail glass illusions of our progress into glittering dust, scattering over the ruins of casinos and the high-rise cemeteries made low. Sea, gnashing at our degraded shoreline, will foam corrosive spume that will dissolve your headstones. They will return to sand. But the poet's words will last. You will hear them. Warnings in the night sea, whispering toward your chambers. It will be the poet's words coming at you in the thundering sermon of the landslide, in the revenging wind swearing down the valley, in the crackling of the sun gone wild. And 
when the earth has had her say in retribution, afterwards, in the green time of healing, there will be other words given to other poets. They will be precious stones with healing properties, mixed with dirt, folded in leaves, used as portices. They will protect the children who recite them. But these words now are for you. David stones found at the river of reflection and gathered in a poem ready. Come, fashioners of progress, come. You hold the steel cuffs of the law, the silver coins of bribery, the gun. But when you see a poet writing poems, run. Let you wear a poet, ka e qui poem. Kui. Kuli yang maha mulia selamati atas takta. As a non-Muslim in Malaysia, the one word that is removed from my vocabulary is the word Allah. Still, it is present in my state anthem. Duli yang maha mulia selamat di atas takta. Lanjutkan usia tuanku, rakyat mohon restu bawa duli tuanku. Blank was what they told me to fill in instead of the A word or Tuhan or God or Jesus or Buddha or Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, Lakshmi or Saraswati. We'll figure it out eventually, but for now it's blank. That they told me the little girl in the navy blue pinafore to say every time she stood up straight and sang with all her heart, remember when we get to that part, you say blank, which is be silent and then finish the rest. Maybe that's why she never became a singer. Instead, she was a poet who still struggled to memorize words that were for her to recite and not realize deeper meanings and understand why she had to spoil the rhythm of the song because they decided what was right from wrong, but never told her what to say when someone asked, how come you never say blank? As a sheet of paper, she wrote down her name, age, and classification of which blank she preferred to bow her head to. She was I, and I wondered if blank existed and what blank looked like. Did blank wear long dresses or a suit and tie? Or did blank speak English, Tamil, Chinese, or Malay? Or was blank here to stay during sunny days and stormy weather? I was never sure. If blank could spot me out of the seven billion people or hear my voice against the whines and whimpers of believers asking their wishes to be granted. But is their blank different from my blank? Or are we all just blank trying to fill in the blank? We keep quiet all that we do not understand, comprehend the fragments of existence with open eye meditation and the sound of silence resonating. Oh. As I put my palms together in front of colorful deities for 10 years, but saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, when I know deep down that the only attention I was vying for was from my father who was upstairs taking a shower, <laughs> who educated me and explained that Islam is a profound religion whose worshipers need no location of worship to worship, just a direction, and cautioned me never to trample on hungry ghost offerings on sidewalks, taught me that Christmas is more important than Santa Claus, and if you lit candles by the altar, you would be blessed, and that every temple is a GPS, an antenna, to give us better reception to the higher power, which I still refer to as blank. And I believed every threat of if you cross this line, then prepare to meet your maker. For what will I tell my children if they were made out of love from one man's blank and another woman's blank, not knowing which blank they really belonged to? Because blank is not a word. Blank is not a state of mind. Blank is what we're still waiting to define, the divine. But I don't know when, and I don't know how. Till then, I am blank. Papa tu anuku, 
Earth Mother. I love that I've read that Tangaroa, the sea god, was your first lover. That despite the weight of being primordial parents, Earth Mother, Sky Father, you lived other lives. I imagine the ways you might have dissolved into that salty saline water where the edges of your bodies met, the pull of those tides. And then Rangi, Sky Father, within that stifling, sensuous, codependent embrace and beyond it, the demands of demigod children pushing you apart, all that longing, an eternity of tears. But I love best that your bountiful body is everything we stand on, land on, ground in. You women are our go-to. The earth under our feet, the goddess that is all maunga, all muscle, slopes, surfaces. You, mother, are home. Papa, foundation based in 26 Austronesian languages, two to stand erect in 45 living languages, Anuku, land, island, sand in 20 Fijiic languages, Papa to Anuku, goddess of all goodness, giving to us all, even the unworthy the absolute unconditional of you. I could write about how we defile and despise you, commercialize and divide you, but that would be about us, not about you. Your serene resilience rules supreme in the face of all we chuck at you. I could write about how violently the proverb changed at the end of guns of an army of empire from men dying and losing themselves completely over women and land. Ma te whenua, ma te wahine, ka ngaro te tangata. To a legally binding adage whereby we all, women and land, became the property of men. But that would be about them, not about us. The conceit of dominion over dominates, but dominion over doesn't feature in any of our epistemologies. There are no single male creators. A man couldn't create on his own. We made sense of our universe coming about through co-creation procreation, copulation, where immensity and space were pulled to each other, beget children, the amino attraction of male and female elements. And we are an extraordinary family of relatives, the trees, the rocks, the sky, and you, Papa Tuanuku, you are the mothership of all the female elements. And as much as the man tries to bind you, bend you to his will, you will resist. And that is one of your men. The man tries to bind you, bend you to his will, you will resist. And that is one of your many legacies. When we love on you, we love on ourselves. When we pause in the busy noise of our days and we look to you, we look to ourselves. When we nurture, tend and care for you, we care for all of us. In a world of lost goddesses, my own Tongan darling, more lost than most, I name you Hikuleo. Once the whole of Tonga revolved around a goddess, it is a truth stranger than fiction. Hikuleo, elder sister of Maui and Tangaloa, 
desecrated, defiled, burned and beaten, still found with the nooses around your necks in museums and mausoleums, scattered sculptures overseas, the only proof of your existence. Hekuleo, even in wiki, the academics have made you a man. But the curves of your breasts, your beautiful belly, your unmistakable fertile places endure beyond that lie. When we honour you, we honour ourselves. We honour women in all of our fullness, wholeness, wildness, power, tapu and mana. Papa tuanuku. All of this, all of us, always, and when my flesh returns to your soft soil, I too will become a part of you, a sacred offering, and then a sigh among many others that sweeps through the essence of your many Māori. All of this, all of us, always, And so the universe began with a single sound. Oh, we start with a diaphragm. For our children, for our grandchildren. No one can hear us. We start with a diaphragm. Oh, we start with a diaphragm. Oh, we start with a diaphragm. Oh, we start with a diaphragm. What is the wealth that cannot rust, cannot rot, that cannot harden into gold bars, evaporating wisps and ghosts of illusionary currencies and cryptocurrencies which the grasping few struggle to hold on and pass on to the grasping few? What? is the common wealth. Common wealth, come on wealth, well, 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 we all tether, tie, tie, tangle, twisted tongues, insides, insides, sight, sound, sound, sensing, common sense in uncommon territories, tear this, tear this earth apart, part this body of mine, mine, mining tin, minding my own, my end. I descend from the greatest navigators in the world, Tonga, Samoa, Fiji, Niue, Tokelau, Māori, the greatest navigators of the world's largest ocean. And even though we explored and occupied every inhabitable island in the world's water continent, we were re-educated to believe that with our uncivilised minds, all we were capable of was drift. I am holding my history textbook in one hand and my father's compass in another. My father says, let go of the past. We cannot color over whitewashed, bloodstained, carpeted histories. Let us move on. Move on to what he does not tell me. All we have ever known is the idea of movement. We push against seas, pull islands closer to our feet so that we can find a place to stand long enough to call it home. What is it we are building? And for whom? What is the wealth we are Is the true wealth? What is the highest wealth? What is the wealth we can most truly hold on to and truly pass on? on what is the common wealth? The only wealth I offer you is that which is uncommon, but birthed specifically out of living sustainably in the smallest islands of the largest ocean for centuries. Navigating all of that uncertainty, it is a relationship with nature we know is never on our own terms. No, it's not just Disney, 
Even NASA is looking to the Moana, exploring the final frontiers of indigenous minds to understand how we, illiterate, read the novel of the night sky, found the secret compasses clutched in stars, followed the sentences in the wingspans of the seabirds, how we, by lying flat backed on the bottom of boats, translated the dizzying texts of sea swells into the haiku of direction. Here lies the sum of our existence, an inheritance of tragedy, triumph, lessons unlearned and stories untold. We are waking up in the skin of our grandmothers, shoving our bodies through a common idea of who we are supposed to be, better, faster, further, where do we go from here? We are tugging at bloodlines and borderlines, stretching, screaming, saying go, bali, Pergi, come, come here, stay, leave us to belong to one. We contradict another. Contradicted, distracted, disconnected, and destroyed. Can we find our way back to where we once belonged in order to find our way forward? Our answers once lay in sacred relationships. Our answers once lay in paying such close attention. Our answers once lay in loving and seeing as divine everything that we are dependent on. Earth, ocean, plants, fresh water, land. This is the highest wealth. The highest wealth is common, held in common, passed on in common, a planet in healing, the body of the earth, our mother, recovering towards her health. This is what we must leave our children and grandchildren. This is the truest, highest, deepest, the most common wealth. You can't resolve a jigsaw's puzzle by interlocking the same few parts. That a small section seems so wonderful, while the multitude seem to have no part. You can't proudly display a Rubik's Cube, then only focus on one side, and deem it united from a single viewpoint, while the other five only see the divide. So imagine if such scattered pieces and hidden positions are realized. The whole can only be completed once we leave no one behind. Can you please give another round of applause to Kendall Hippolyte, Carla Myler, and Melizarani T. Selva. Wow, gave me goosebumps, man. I ain't gonna lie. Wow, you know? Ooh. Okay. Right, here we go. During the course of the three days, we'll be using the polling app Glissa today to let you text in your questions for various sessions and vote in the polls throughout the event. So 
We'd like you all to get your phones, and let's all do this together. So, phones on silent, of course, right? But get your phones, and we'd like you to input or answer questions on your smartphone or tablet or laptop. There's no need to download anything, just put in this URL. Have we got it coming up? It's glsr.it forward slash CW people. So if you can just put that into your internet browser or on your device or your phone, or you can, you'll be on our Wi-Fi system or use your 4G data. And when prompted, simply type in answers to the polling questions or submit your questions to the chair and press send. Okay, so let's, let's give this a try. Has everybody, has everybody put that in there? Okay then, right. Oh, no, no, throw up, throw up the, can you go back to the, um, to the glisser? It's at the top, right. We're going to ask an ice-breaking question. Where in the world do you live? And just click on the image of the continent where you live. Oh, no, it's coming up. Wow. It's working. OK, we've got 20% from Africa, 30% from Asia. Sixty percent Europe, five percent South America. Oh wow, this is moving. Oh right, Caribbean's come up. Right, that's got to be Kendall, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, and VJ. Wow, three percent Oceania. You haven't got your phone. Oh, okay then. This is really exciting, actually. This is like. A Oh, wow. Okay, then. I think, has it, I think everyone's pretty much got the gist of it. You're doing really, really well. Because obviously that, the fact that it's moving means that every, you know, new people are, are logging on and clicking on. But as I said, throughout the course of the, the three days, we'll be running different polls, and this is how you'll be answering the questions. Um, let's move on to the next question. What does the renewal of the Commonwealth mean? Now, if you can type one word in the white text box of what you think the renewal of the Commonwealth means, just one word, and we'll see how the words come up. So we've got inclusivity. Diversity. Justice. Engagement, wow. And so the bigger the word, that means the more people are using it. Equality's come big up, wow. Diversity, collectivity, redistribution. We're going to be polling these same questions on day three, so we're going to see if there are any different responses, but it's just interesting to see how people feel coming in on day one. Wow, equality is a big one. I don't. I think. I think. I think equality is going to be the big one, right? Um, but as I said, we'll we'll ask the same question in three days' time just to see if there's a, a difference in terms of the. Wow, love. That's a poet. That's definitely. That's a poet's response, right? Um, okay, let's go. Let's move on to question three. In your view, what would an accountable institution look like? So in your own personal view, one word to describe what you would imagine an accountable institution to look like. Bottom up, sustainable, representative, inclusive, transparent, open, wow, responsive. Oh, you guys are getting the hang of this now, I can see. <laughs> Re 
responsive is looking big. I'm going to read the small ones. We've got integrity, honest, empowered, participation, transparent seems to be the big one. Okay, transparent seems to be the big one. As I said, we'll be asking these same questions at the end of the three days just to see after the discussions that new thoughts or maybe, I guess, a, a reaffirmation of your initial thoughts might come up in three days' time. Now, each day we're going to have a different theme. The theme for today is leave no one behind. And we're exploring exclusion in the Commonwealth. So we're going to have a break now for 30 minutes. And after the break, we're going to have a keynote speech from Ben Ockridge.